action figures. On this episode, I am bringing you a better late than never review of the Bandai Tamashi Nation's Dragon Ball Z SH Figure Arts Metal Cooler from the Dragon Ball Z movie Return of Cooler. The Dragon Ball Z movies often get written off for not being uh, canon or impactful to the sort of regular anime story or the manga story, but I personally always really enjoyed them as little condensed pocket stories in the Dragon Ball universe with longer um, development timelines compared to the anime, and therefore um, often much higher quality art and animation. There are so many little moments of animation brilliance in the Dragon Ball Z movies that I honestly think they're a great way to kind of introduce somebody to Dragon Ball if they're not familiar. It's not going to be um, super important to remember all the story details. The Return of Cooler is uh, one of my top three favorite DBZ movies because of the heavy sci-fi influence and uh, nowhere is that more apparent than in the title villain himself. Um, if you're wondering, my other two favorite DVZ movies are Dead Zone, the first one, um, and Fusion Reborn, which is movie 12, I want to say. I like things about all of them. There's not really one that I don't like. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely worth checking out if you're a DBZ fan or a Dragon Ball fan and you uh, don't necessarily mind if something's not canon, you just enjoy uh, tight stories with some really good action, animation, and special effects. Um, so, uh, The Return of Cooler brings us the title villain in this sort of liquid metal Terminator body, which uh, is really, really unique. One of my favorite designs, um, while I love the fourth and fifth forms of Cooler from Cooler's Revenge, uh, this one is definitely my favorite. First thing to talk about with this figure is the pricing and availability, which uh, quite honestly is a pretty significant negative that it has to overcome in my book. Um, the premium Bandai exclusive thing is okay. It's just kind of a good way to uh, cover their risk and uh, tighten their order quantity. What I do have a problem with is the price, which on premium Bandai was 120 US dollars plus the $10 that they charge for shipping plus sales tax, which brings it to at least 135, almost 140. Compare that to the base price in Japanese yen, which was 12,000. And if you do the currency conversion, 12,000 yen is about 80 US dollars. So that still leaves like 40 to 60 US dollars to play around with for shipping to uh, get this figure imported from Japan, which is what I did. Bundled with a couple of other figures that I was ordering at the time, distribute that among three figures. If Premium Bandai is sort of the main promoted platform for purchasing these exclusives in the US, they need to line their prices up better with the Japanese release. Now, my very high level understanding of vac metal or chrome plating is the plastic parts for this figure are placed in a vacuum chamber. Uh, and some metal substance, I don't know if it's aluminum, is evaporated into the chamber and bonds to the surface of the plastic, forming a metallic surface on the plastic itself. And um, that is what creates this like mirror finish on the figure rather than just uh, like a metallic paint or a pearlescent paint. Like we've seen pearlescent paint with some of the Super Saiyan hair lately. We've seen metallic paint with figures such as Golden Frieza. Also seen like pearlescent or high gloss paint for the um, original 2.0, the 2.0 Kaoken Goku. This is a little different. This is, I am assuming, not a paint finish, but an actual like metal plating process that they have used 
to make this, and I'm guessing that based on the price and the way the figure feels in hand, which uh, a lot of people have described as kind of like a model kit, a little bit lighter in hand, and that's due to using harder plastics throughout kind of the core parts of the figure. And the reason that's necessary is um, when applying back metal or chrome plating, the plastic has to be resistant to deformation. So if it's too soft, what can happen is um, as you're moving the figure, the, the plastic gets these little microscopic deformations in it and uh, essentially kind of loosens the metal plating finish and causes it to flake off or chip away. That has a couple of other implications that I don't think people have really discussed so far. And when you are designing a tool or a mold for an action figure, you have to take into account the type of plastic that you're going to put into that mold because not all plastics have the same thermal properties. When you inject hot plastic into a mold, um, it forms in one particular volume and then as it cools and hardens, it essentially like kind of shrinks in volume and the amount of shrinkage differs between hard plastic like ABS or a softer PVC type plastic. And so for the people who are thinking they'll just go ahead and reuse this mold and put out like a basic metallic paint version, I don't know about that. They might, but it might still have to use the same materials as this particular uh, metal plated figure. I also heard a lot of reviews describing the feel uh, out of the box as very oily, and I'm someone who just doesn't like oily, slick um, substances on my hands, and so that is uh, something else I wanted to try to kind of avoid with the gloves. It also means that uh, it's not the most fun figure to pose around because of the fear of scratching something or um, pushing a, a joint too far if that joint is made of a harder plastic than they would typically use. Um, it just makes the figure feel more delicate, is the best way to put it. I've seen a lot of comments that they'll, that they're most of the way to a fourth form cooler with this figure. Um, maybe they can reuse some of the like digital models, but like I said, I don't think they would reuse the molds. Not only was this mold uh, specifically made for this chrome-plated version of the figure. Um, there are also some differences in the design of the character that uh, wouldn't be applicable to the fourth form. So we'll talk about that as we get into the details. I'm glad that they made this figure. I really wish, and I've heard almost everybody say they wish they could have bought more than one because um, spoiler for the return of Cooler, uh, this is a clone, basically, and there are thousands of these Cooler, metal Cooler clones that Goku and Vegeta fight in the movie, and uh, that price tag really was prohibitive there. Historically, they have used processes for metallic figures like Golden Frieza, or the more pearlescent metallic for Kaioken Goku that I would be perfectly happy with um, going forward. And from what I can tell, that makes these figures much more affordable than Metal Cooler. Now, I don't see too much opportunity to uh, apply the super expensive finish to many more characters in Dragon Ball. The ones I'm most worried about are Nova and Ice Shenron from Dragon Ball GT. Um, especially because they are a pair. Uh, really hope they just do kind of a standard metallic or pearlescent finish on those. Also, I'm going to be doing an upcoming uh, top 10 Dragon Ball Figuarts wishlist and bucket list video. 
Um, the difference being wish list is assuming the line's not ending anytime soon, what are the top 10 figures I personally would want to collect? And bucket list is how does that list change if these are the last 10 figures being made in the line? Um, it makes for a pretty interesting distinction, and I'm pretty sure Nova and Ice Shenron will be on at least one of those lists, so be sure to follow my channel and uh, keep a lookout for that video. I'm really looking forward to that discussion and seeing what everybody else's lists would be. All right, and the last thing I wanted to talk about before we get into the box and the figure is um, the color of Metal Cooler. Is it Metal Cooler? I always thought it was Meta Cooler. Maybe it's a translation thing. Um, in the early promotional images, uh, of the prototype figure, which are also featured on the box here, the finish was pretty much a straight chrome, uh, like grayscale, no hue whatsoever. And I was pretty vocally against this at the time, and I think I can prove, uh, make a pretty convincing case for um, why the updated kind of teal tint that they've applied to him is actually much more accurate. The movie takes place on the planet New Namek, and Namek is famous for its blue grass and green skies forever, um, often gives characters kind of a teal reflection that uh, has been the subject of some debate. The first I noticed of it was with the fourth form Frieza figures, which uh, started out like basically gray, um, got a little bit of a teal tint with the second release, and finally with this third release got a strong bluish teal tint. Gray was out on whether Frieza should have actually been that color from the jump, or if Frieza is really gray and the teal was just Namek reflecting off of his skin. Metal Cooler, um, unfortunately, only appears on New Namek in the movie, and uh, except for a few select scenes, uh, is completely in the outdoor Namek environment. You could make the argument that the teal is just the reflection of the environment around him. However, this has gone on to influence... Um, pretty much every other appearance of this character in the video games, trading cards, um, any kind of external Dragon Ball media, he has that same finish because that's the only way he appears. The very few select scenes in the movie which take place inside the Big Getty Star. Um, there are a couple. First off, when uh, Metal Cooler is facing Piccolo, still has the teal tint, and uh, <laughs> I was pretty convinced, okay, but uh, then I thought, well, Piccolo's green, and it's just the green of Piccolo's skin reflecting off. There is another scene with kind of an army of metal coolers approaching um, the crowd of the other earthlings. Again, it shows him with this metallic teal finish, and so uh, that for me, pretty conclusive evidence that Metal Cooler is teal. It is not the environment of Namek. Perhaps it is also reflecting off of him, but even beneath that, he is a metallic, aqua, teal, bluish green. I don't really think it's a debate. It's right there in the movie. Packaging, it is pretty much your standard uh, SH Figure Arts box. Height-wise, compared to the Awakened Super Saiyan Blood Vegeta. And you can see it's roughly the same width. Um, it is just a little bit deeper to accommodate his tail. It's a little bit unusual to me that they updated the finish on the figure to be bluish green, but not the box art. I would have thought that the box art would be the easier of the two things to update. However, they have retained the original silver of the uh, first prototype. Um, 
in both the promo images on the box as well as the accent color, which is silver. So uh, that's a little strange. I would have liked them to update that as well to match the figure. Front of the box, we have your futuristic running man pose, logos, Bandai, Tamashii Nations, SH Figure Arts, holographic Tamashii Nations quality sticker, holographic Toei Animation sticker. This uh, product is intended for ages 15 and up, and warning that it contains choking hazard small parts, not for children under three years. Um, product may differ from photo. Dragon Ball Z, designed by Tamashii Nations in Japan, Bandai Spirits, made in China. Metal cooler in this metallic font. Um, that's a little bit special compared to the standard white print on the general release Vegeta here. Now spinning around to the less exciting side, we just have some window and name of the character at the bottom. On the right side, we have a death beam pointing finger, a continuation of the running man, serious looking forward face, and a shot of his tail. The bottom of the box, it's just the smirking portrait. On the bottom, it has the bottom of the box features the smirking portrait and the metallic silver accent color. And then spinning around to the back, we see the death beam pose, the smirking face, the smirking face full body standing on the rock. The why don't you just army build this $120 figure? Thanks for that one, Bandai Tamashi. Um, running man pose. Attacking pose, kicking pose, um, simple style, heroic action, SH, super action, Bandai Namco. This is the Japanese release, so um, I've got Japanese distributor details down here. On top of the box, we just have window. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and break them out. All right, I've got my trusty hobby knife. I've cut the tape previously since I've had this figure out. He made my top 10, 10 of 2023, just because of my love for this character in this form. Go ahead and uh, use the knife blade to flip the flap. And we've got a no color printed on the inside of the box here. We have some QR codes. I'm guessing there's nothing printed here because they've gone ahead and put basically a mirror in the back of this box. Um, very interesting. And then uh, behind that is the instructions, which are pretty straightforward, just showing you how to swap out the hands, swap out the heads, swap out the feet, and attach the tail, swap the damaged regenerating arm, um, and warning, may rub off, just pointing everywhere. <laughs> All parts of this product have been painted. Please take thorough care when handling the product as there is risk of scratching the product when assembling and operating it. How fun. Um, please do not use excessive force when bending, pulling, or attaching movable parts. It's interesting they call it painted. It still kind of has the feel of a chrome-plated figure, however. The figure includes four interchangeable heads, each with a different uh, expression. They're a little bit hard to see, but we have sort of a serious neutral face, grimacing face, a smirking face, and a shouting face. Five pairs of hands, including fists, single finger pointing death beam hands, um, relaxed hands, open clenched finger hands, open spread finger hands and then we have two pairs of feet we have a flat pair and and a pair with clenched toes we have his tail which has a couple points of articulation that we'll go over and finally his regenerating arm which comes in two parts a shoulder which replaces the shoulder cap and then the arm itself which replaces basically everything from the bicep down and that's it for the accessories. 
can go ahead and lift him out of the tray. Removing from the tray, since he can be a little bit slippery, I unfortunately dropped one of the heads um, trying to grab it out of here, a little out of my hand. It was actually this head here, and so you can see it's got a little scuff on the dome there, unfortunately, because it fell onto my table. You really can't tell until you get something white near him that he has that sort of teal reflectiveness. And it's very odd um, because he's kind of just reflecting the dark room and almost appears black on camera. He is this more silvery teal color. It was kind of uh, an interesting idea for Tamashi to offer a pair of white gloves around the same time as this release. I don't know if they've ever tried to handle a figure with cotton gloves on, but um, wouldn't recommend. These are archival gloves with mostly cotton, but um, they also have these soft vinyl nodules on the fingers, so I do get a little bit of a grip on the figure to uh, assist with handling him. And out of the package, let's go ahead and attach his tail and we'll go over all the details on him. Um, it is going to make him a little bit back heavy, so I'm going to try to kind of curl it around behind him to give him... It is definitely more points of articulation than any of the Frieza tails so far and more than the imperfect cell. I do think the monster art style where every little segment has a ball joint is an interesting idea, but I've never had one of those figures in hand. Like the tails really do need to be kind of posable. Frieza's moveset in Fighters, for example, um, incorporates his tail quite a lot. Um, we can see which parts are chrome plated and which parts are just painted the face, the collarbone and the neck, the tops of these butterfly joints, the uh, biceps and the tops of his forearms, and actually the hands, which is interesting because I think his hands are pretty much done in the finish that I would have liked to see on the entire figure. Um, they're actually painted this really beautiful metallic teal. I don't know if they did that to reduce costs since he has so many pairs of hands, but compared to the feet, which are actually uh, chrome plated, it's a little unusual. It doesn't really bother me visually, but it just kind of underscores how I really think they should have just done this on the whole figure. It would have looked fantastic. Now you can hear him creaking as I just like get him in kind of a neutral standing pose. And that's another quirk of this figure. You might see some little what look like scratches, but I'm guessing those are lint from my gloves more often than not. Um, like I said, I did drop this head changing it out one time and that definitely left a little scratch. As far as the chrome plated parts, um, they're pretty extensive, which I wasn't really expecting. Like the insides of these butterfly joints, the inner leg joint, which I really wasn't expecting, and uh, that even includes like this hinge part, the knee joints, as far as the sculpt of this figure, it is just outstanding. Um, starting with the face, you can see these really uh, Dragon Ball villain greatest hits features, like these lines down the cheek, these vents for ears, back segments there, and then on the butterfly joints, not to be missed, is this corrugated metal piece, which is accurate. Similarly, uh, down his abdomen, design elements that would not carry over to fourth form cooler. 
I'm not sure if the head is 100% the same. I don't know if fourth form had this, these vents on the side. He does not have this. Um, he also has just a solid abdomen. Basically below the rib cage, it's all straight purple, at least down to the shin armor, I guess. Toes and fingers all have these segments, similarly for the tail. Um, fourth form wouldn't have the segmented tail like that. I do see a little scratch on the forearm there. I don't know if that's just the result of changing the parts at some point, but um, let's see what we can do with this tail. Uh, there's not a ton of posing options, but you can get it kind of twisted around and doing some interesting stuff. Um, there's another little scratch on the side of his tail there, on that segment right there. Um, I've only ever handled this figure with gloves. Uh, but he still managed to have some scratches. I think they came that way, if I remember correctly. Let's give him a little, like, curl around like that. And then um, one thing that is also a little bit annoying is how easily the feet pop off makes them easier to change, but maybe a little too easy. See, all I did was try to stand him and just putting any pressure around that uh, ankle joint tends to kind of pop the foot. The cocky grin of superiority. So let's go ahead and swap that on. Um, his heads have this very unusual joint and I don't know exactly why. If you have any ideas about why the neck is designed that way, let me know. Um, some of the best 3.0 hips that I've seen, especially for a smooth, seamless kind of look. Um, I think if they do a 3.0 Vegeta, they ought to give him hips very similar to this. Um, give him kind of his seamless jumpsuit look. Um, you just want to be careful not to articulate more than one joint at a time on this guy. That's how you can, I think that's how you get into trouble with uh, parts rubbing. Let's see, death beam is there sort of relaxed at neutral attack. tail does make him a bit back heavy, so you also want to be mindful of that. You really can't tell the true colors without um, some kind of white reflective surface nearby. So the regenerating arm goes on his left arm, and the way to attach it is first remove 
the shoulder pad, which is just on a little ball joint that's attached to this double hinge on the shoulder. And then you can kind of raise the arm and pull apart like so. One of the coolest little nuggets of animation um, where his arm is damaged and all these wires just fly out. So the arm piece does not articulate and it just plugs up into the shoulder and then the shoulder cap has this ball joint and that just goes over the ball joint on the torso. But that was pretty much my like special effect part requirement for this figure. He's got to have a regenerating part. That is the coolest <laughs> little animation that he does. And you know what? As far as like little animation nuggets in the movies, um, I want to give them plenty of time to cook on Janemba because I would love to see them do the voxel teleport animation. Now, it can be a little bit tricky to reattach his shoulder. Um, it does just go onto that ball, but um, because it's a metal coated part, it's a little slippery. So it can be kind of hard to get a grip on it. There we go. Um, as I was saying before, he is probably the squeakiest action figure that I own, which is a little weird. Let's see, how about like that? That looks all right. He cannot articulate in the torso a ton because of these armor pieces colliding with each other, and you want to be very, very careful when especially leaning him forward or backwards because they will rub on each other if you are not. And we're going to go ahead and equip the alternate foot just to show you how that looks. Let's go ahead and borrow our rock sold separately. I think this grimacing expression is my favorite. They really got a, a really nice like ridge on his brow and the shape of his mouth. All right, and then let's go ahead and put him into a kicking pose of some sort. 
they've got them in a high kick pose on the box. He's not going to kick too high though. And we'll give him the shouting head. about the extent of the kicking range. You can maybe twist at the thigh swivel and push it a little bit. Probably get him to balance on one foot, but let's give it a shot. Running through Metal Cooler's articulation, he has a double ball peg going from the neck into the head, and then another ball peg at the base of the neck into the torso. With that, um, you can look up about looks down pretty well about 45 or a little bit past 45 down. Double hinged elbow, which gets 130, 135 degrees bend. Um, standard figure arts, ball hinge wrists, which can go up and down just a little bit um, due to the sculpt of the forearm. And they also, if you rotate them, can go in and out. His torso is interesting. A couple of ball joints going on. This like inner piece here is separate. Uh, this like undersuit looking piece moves around beneath these armor plated pieces and he doesn't really go back very much because the sculpt of his back runs into the tail combined um, and he doesn't lean backwards much uh, whatsoever uh, so yeah tilting backwards is not going to be his strong suit here as long as you are careful to make sure the chest goes over the abdomen you can tilt him forward almost 45 degrees forward which is pretty pretty good and then combined with the neck he can look almost straight down the hips um, they kick forward little less than 90 degrees before running into the waist. Um, if you kick them to the side a little bit, they get pretty much 90 degrees, but it is kicking to the side. You can swivel the waist to compensate for that though. And that works okay. Um, they don't really kick back um, because of the tail, but you can kind of kick them out back to the side 
like so if you are very careful sort of achieve a front to back split but it doesn't look very good <laughs> And everything on this guy is like a creaky old house. Except for these knees, they're pretty smooth. Um, to get them to go their full range, you gotta kick them to the side to get past the tail, but uh, they go even past 135. And then ankles are your kind of swivel hinges. They just go down a little bit and up a little tiny amount and if you push it too much they are the feet are just gonna pop off I guess we can talk about his tail while he's like this it has four swivel hinges and one hinge you would think that this would swivel as well and it is locked in place which is kind of an odd design choice to me. I'm not really sure why they wouldn't let you swivel the base of his tail, but as it is, it makes it kind of difficult to get him in just kind of a relaxed tail on the ground sort of pose. You could kind of achieve it. Um, but the sculpt and finish on his tail really doesn't lend itself to this articulation setup. Um, everybody's pointed out that it breaks the sculpt and finish if you use any of these as a swivel. So um, as you saw when I was posing him, you can kind of do some things and hide breaks. It's definitely not an ideal system here. And I do have like some areas between the joints that are maybe rubbing a little bit and chipping away some of the finish, which I don't love to see. All right, now let's do side to sides. Um, to raise the arms in a T pose, his shoulder pads are on this double hinge ball peg combo. Um, it's very similar to the Din Djarin Mandalorian figure. If you saw my review for that one, it's um, kind of the same style shoulder pad here. And that does let him raise his arms really nicely. Um, you can even get them past the uh, T. Tilting his neck. Um, he gets a really good amount of tilt there, about 45 degrees. And then, of course, uh, his head swivels around on his neck. Torso, he can tilt a pretty decent amount, honestly. Again, be very careful to clear the chest over the abdomen. And he can get at least a good 30 degrees of tilt, and then combined with the neck, he can look at you sideways. Can swivel at the waist, but it, the sculpt here really doesn't lend itself to it. This rib cage diaphragm piece kind of crashes into the abdomen. I twist and tilt forward, but uh, it doesn't feel super comfy to do that. And then his hips, um, he gets almost 90 degree splits either way. His ankles don't really swivel much just due to the kind of sculpt of his feet compared to Frieza where the heel is like part of the joint. It's about as wide as he can get with his feet flat. The thigh swivel is hidden really well. It's kind of similar to like the legendary Super Saiyan Goku, but that was the baggy pants version. This is the seamless bodysuit version, and I 
really think um, this would work well for Vegeta uh, and other characters who wear tight leg pants. Leg pants, you know those. Um, characters that don't wear pants, like Metal Cooler here. Bicep swivel as below the shoulders there. And then uh, last but not least, his butterfly joints are a 3.0 style butterfly joint with a pretty uh, complex little apparatus in there. Yeah, you can kind of cross his wrists. Um, and then going back, there's not as much room in the sculpt. You can see the uh, the back of his shoulder is uh, not cut out the way the front is, so um, he can just almost touch his hands, but not quite. These are 3.0 joints, and they can go in and out as well. So very easily brings his hands together over his head. Return of Cooler is the first uh, DBZ movie to feature Vegeta. It's also the first movie to feature Super Saiyan Vegeta. Um, and it might be the first time we see Vegeta and Goku fight side by side. Here, uh, you can see Vegeta is a little bit shorter, unless you count the hair. This is the uh, demoniacal fit Martialist Forever body with legendary Super Saiyan Goku's head. Um, I have a custom neck peg that I printed. Um, not a perfect solution, but gets the job done. 3.0 Super Saiyan Full Gi Goku, <laughs> and you can see he's just a little bit taller than Metal Cooler. I love this character. I love this design. I do not love this figure as much as I hoped I would, and it's pretty much just down to the finish. Unfortunately, I wish they had just done this metallic pearlescent paint like they did for all of his hands throughout the body instead of the metal plating. Um, it would make him affordable enough to get a couple. It would make him infinitely more fun to handle. As it stands, I mean, he's a beautiful figure, but this is like way, way beyond what I I'm looking to collect in this Dragon Ball line. Event exclusive, maybe this is appropriate, but as just the only release for this form of this character, I don't know. Very mixed feelings on this one. The finish is beautiful, but delicate, and really um, inhibits my enjoyment of posing this figure. Um, it's just not a fun figure for me to handle. I'm always worried about scratching him. If you've got him, let me know what you think. I think he's kind of a pose him up and don't touch him kind of figure, and I don't love uh, figure arts dipping into that space very much. This has been The Art of Action Figures, and I hope you've enjoyed this review of the SHF Metal Cooler from DBZ. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.